For Crema Media's Polity, I'm Shannon DeRayhove. I'm at the Institute for Security Studies speaking to Gareth Newham about violent crime in South Africa. During President Jacob Zuma's 2015 State of the Nation address, you noted that it was worrying that he had very little to say about the growing levels of violent crime. Why does this concern you? The State of the Nation address should be the moment that the President of the country um, uses as an opportunity to explain to people, look, this is what we've achieved, but also these are the challenges we're facing as a country, and we all need to work collectively to address these challenges. And one such challenge we're facing at the moment is an increase in most categories of serious violent crime. And he didn't mention that. And because he didn't mention it, it will not really be something that the police, the Minister of Police, the um, government, will necessarily pay attention to because they read through the minister, the, the president's State of the Nation address to see what the priorities are. That's how it communicates to both the public and the state. And by not mentioning it, we're not going to be able to get the kinds of responses to what is a growing problem, um, either from the state or from the public, uh, quickly enough before it gets much worse. So ideally, it should have been mentioned that, look, we have an increase in these kinds of crime categories, and this is what we need to do in order to reduce them. Generally, in the case of murder, there are at least six male murder victims for every one female victim, which is a phenomenon experienced the world over. However, murders against women and children have also been increasing. Why is this? Well, we see murder increasing across the board, which is very worrying. Um, the usual relationship between murder and other crime categories is that a vast majority of our murders, two-thirds or more of our murders, are perpetrated by people who know each other or live in the same communities. Um, mostly males. Uh, for every one woman that is murdered, there are six males that are murdered. Uh, and that is because of, of males becoming more violent. Um, but it usually starts off as a disagreement or an argument that escalates into an assault and then in some cases ends in a murder. So there's often a very close correlation between your murder statistics and your assault statistics. Um, but what we're seeing here is that the police assault statistics show a big decline. Um, but we see big increases in murders. So to put this in context, um, there are now, as the last year that we have crime statistics for, there were over 1,700 more murders than there were two years ago. So that means that every day on average, there are four more people being murdered than there were two years ago. This is worrying for us because it's a fundamental shift in the murder trend that we've seen uh, since 1994. In fact, South Africa has seen an over 50% uh, reduction in murders over the last 20 years. So that we've had two years of consecutive increases in murder and that the rate of murder is increasing. So two years ago it went up 650 cases, last year it went up over 800 cases. So the rate of increase is in increasing. Um, that is why um, we see there's a problem and the issue with it's affecting women, men and children. It's not just males. So there's something else driving the murder rate other than assault. There is usually a close link between assault and murder, yet in South Africa police report a decline in the number of assaults with a substantial increase in the number of murders. What could explain this situation? Well, if your murder rate is going up, and in the past you've seen there's a correlation, and this is not just in South Africa, it's a, it's a global trend in most countries, that your murder rates and assault rates are very closely linked because most assaults, uh, or most murders, are the end result of an assault. But in South Africa the police recorded um, almost a 7% dec decline in murders last year. Over the last two years they've shown, they've said that there are 24,000 fewer assaults than two years ago, but um, big increases in murder. So obviously something else is driving or contributing to the murder rate. Um, that's when we looked at the aggravated robbery rate. Aggravated robberies occur or recorded as a crime as an aggravated robbery when one or more in individuals who are armed Use, the for use force or threaten force against somebody to steal from them. So most of these, ca these take place in the street and affect poor people or people who use public transport. They're often associated with people leaving or going to or from a transport node like a train station or a taxi rank or something like that early in the mornings and in the evenings. Um, and that's about two-thirds of all robberies. And then uh, there are other smaller categories, but uh, though all cases are growing. These are house robberies where people are attacking their homes. Um, businesses, especially small businesses, get targeted a lot, farms, uh, and then car hijacking. Uh, and we see that all these kinds of robberies are going up. Now, when they go up, um, about 16% of our murders uh, are, in the past have been attributed to, to robberies. But because we've seen this big increase in robberies, so in other words, 18,000 more robberies took place last year than two years before. 
That's almost 50 more armed robberies every single day on average in South Africa in the most recent crime statistics compared to two years ago. So we can see now that one of the contributing factors to this increase in murder is this dramatic and substantial increase, double-digit increases, in, in armed attacks on people on the streets, in their homes, and in their businesses. And that's what's probably driving and pushing the, and the robbery rate up. And why it's important to mention this, and it's important for the government to, 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 to acknowledge this, is because you can police robbery down relatively easily using um, known and existing resources and known strategies. It's far more difficult to reduce murder if, there is, if the cause of murder is something like the assaults I was talking about, because you can't, those are, are often uh, the result of complex interactions of social factors, use of alcohol, access to weapons, but the dynamics that occur between people at a local level, you can't really police that. That's a lot more about dealing with um, people's perceptions of their self, self-esteem, how they're educated when they're staying in school and that kind of thing. can have more of an impact on that, but it's very difficult to police. But robberies are committed by a relatively small number of people who commit a vast majority of all robberies. They do it over and over again, start with street robberies, they get more organized after a few years and then start attacking bigger targets because they have to do it less frequently and get better reward. And the risks for getting caught and prosecuted are very low at the moment. So if you increase that risk using proper crime intelligence to assess the um, patterns and trends, identify where they sell the stolen goods to because they, especially when they're attacking houses and businesses, they're going for things like electronic goods, cell phones, um, DVD players, um, jewelry. You can trace where those things are being sold and then you can identify those individuals. Also, there's often a witness because the person who's been robbed has direct sight of the robber. And they leave fingerprints and other and footprints and other kind of DNA of the scene. So it is a crime that the Gauteng police in the past, in 2001, in the run-up to the World Cup, managed to reduce robberies in Gauteng by using such a strategy, uh, increasing the arrest rates by over 100%, the conviction rates went up by 30%, and we saw double-digit declines in all forms of robbery at that time. But because the robbery was then going down, the police then took the alpha ball, disbanded that st strategy and started policing everything more generally again. And now we've seen these increases going up. So it's something that the police can get on top of. But unless people acknowledge there's a problem and the police are acknowledging this and starting to put together anti-robbery strategies, this crime will just keep on growing. More and more young men who are unemployed um, will see the benefits of beginning robbery in, the, in, in areas where they live, where they see people involved in these rob uh, robberies driving nice cars, wearing nice clothes, having money to spend, um, and that will be a push factor or pull factor into more people doing this and this crime will continue to grow until it becomes intolerable and too many people are being killed in the, on, the, on the streets of South Africa and in their homes and then we'll see this massive public outcry. But we shouldn't have to wait for that, we should be acting now to prevent that outcome from occurring. There has been a substantial decline in reporting rates for sexual offences, which could give the impression that these offences are declining. Why is there such a decline in the number of victims who are willing to report criminal incidents to the police? Well, there's been a, that's one big notable outcome or finding from the National Victims of Crime Survey that was undertaken and released by Statistics South Africa last year, is that most crime categories are seeing big reductions in police reporting. In other words, the proportion of victims that are victims of assault, uh, sexual offences, um, fraud, fewer proportion if we are, are reporting these crimes to the police. And when it comes to assault, it's likely that assault's actually staying quite stable because although the police recorded a 6.8% uh, reduction in the numbers of assaults over the last two years, since 2011, the number of assault victims who've reported their assault to the police have dropped by 7%. Um, it's far more uh, pronounced with sexual offences. When you look at the proportion of people who said they reported a sexual offence to the police two years ago, it's 21% 20, higher than it is as of last year. So there's been a one-fifth drop in the number of victims of sexual offences who are willing to report the cases to the police. So when the police um, present statistics showing reductions in assault and sexual offences and in commercial crime, those reductions are far smaller than the proportions of people who are not reporting. Mm -hmm. So these crimes could actually still be going up in real terms, it's just that smaller numbers of people reporting them so it looks as if those crimes are going down. And that's very worrying mm -hmm. because it gives people, poli the police a false sense that these crimes, they're getting on top of crimes which they're not getting on top of. Mm -hmm. They just simply aren't registering them, they don't know about them. Um, the reasons why people don't report crime to the police is often because they don't think anything will come of it. So a recent survey by Future Facts found that 44% of South Africans don't think there's any point in reporting crimes to the police because the police can't necessarily do something about it. Mm -hmm. And that's often true in not only in South Africa, in all countries. Mm -hmm. But we also have a problem of growing credibility trust in the police. So we see, uh, for instance, 75% of people saying they think that there are a lot of criminals in the police. 
we see 66% are saying, uh, in the Human Science Research Council study saying that they think that all or most police are corrupt. This is not true, but these are perceptions that then feed into how people perceive the police and where they engage with the police. One third of people say they're scared of the police and will not go to police stations to report a crime because of fear of the police. Mm -hmm. Now, that is a result of systemic um, problems of police brutality and corruption, mm -hmm. where people see too many police officials who act unfairly or use unnecessary force, um, are not accountable, are not held accountable. We see very few, um, the police themselves um, fire very few police officials every year. Although five, over 500 disciplinary hearings end every year with a recommendation of dismissal, the police really dismiss over 120 of those. So even when their own internal systems say this person is being involved in serious misconduct and we should dismiss them, in most cases they don't dismiss that person. They allow them to appeal and keep them on. So we have, Why? it's because of this culture of, of feeling um, uh, that, uh, that there's an us versus them kind of situation. Rather than a police service, that we all work with as a public to try and get on top of a crime problem, that we work together against the criminals, the police have, because of this crisis of leadership, when the leaders of the police feel under pressure and unable to cope with the jobs that they're given, mm -hmm. they become incredibly insular, incredibly um, closed and sensitive and defensive. They won't engage about issues, they attack critics that they, or people they perceive as being critical, rather than having open democratic debates and collectively, in a robust way, coming to a, a, an agreement on how to move forward. They close down, so they won't reduce, release information like crime stats regularly or any information. Um, and then that creates a, an organizational culture which is very closed and the, the idea is that you protect each other, you protect your own. So um, in order to maintain this idea that the police must uh, keep together, um, they don't want to then hold those police officials accountable because it seems like they're acting against their own and that weakens the internal, internal accountability mechanisms. This is not unique to South Africa. This is, this is a, a fundamental occupation reality of police agencies around the world. Mm. Um, but in police agencies in high crime environments with leadership who are um, not able to be open and, and, and responsive to the needs of communities, you find that culture becoming particularly pronounced here and in other countries. And so that is why we, we don't have the kind of relationships between the police, civil society, private sector, and the public as, as broad as we should have. And that can change, because if we had um, very confident uh, men and women running the police agency who were very clear about what needed to be done to fix it, could put a clear plan of action with very measurable milestones and achievements on the table and say, this is how we're going to fix brutality, corruption, this is how we're going to tackle robbery, this is how we're going to improve police morale. Um, these things can be done, they have been done in South Africa and in other countries. Um, then you'll start seeing an openness and a willingness to work together, more people work together, and the police will have much more impact in, in tackling crime. But we need to go back to the National Development Plan, which recognizes that, that starts with the leadership. We need the right leadership. And for too long now, um, for the last 10 years or more, we've had political appointees, people appointed for reasons not because they know how to fix the police or fight crime, but because of their loyalty to particular factions in the, in, in, in the ruling elite. And that has been the fundamental problem facing the South African Police Service for over a decade now. You state that South Africa has sufficient resources, many experienced people and a range of capabilities to reduce levels of violence in our country. Yet poor appointments and political interference plague the SAPS. Why is President Jacob Zuma so reluctant to firstly acknowledge violent crime and secondly to appoint people who can affect the required turnaround? Well, one of the big problems the police have faced is a crisis of leadership at the top. And these are, um, a, this is a diagnosis from the National Planning Commission. We keep on having new national commissioners. We've had about five in the last six or so years. Mm -hmm. um, and big problem is that the last three have had no policing experience. So they come into an organization that is very complex, very large, almost 200,000 people that has uh, offices in, in 1,135 stations across the country and they don't know anything about the job of policing, what, it, what it's like to actually walk the beat, to be a detective, um, and the different uh, challenges faced with managing the different functions of policing. They have no clue about that and no independent knowledge of that so that when they start getting various suggestions from a wide range of people around them, all who might have, many of them have vested interests, um, even in all police agency, there will be some kind of rivalry between people who do visible policing, crime intelligence, detectives. So they're all saying different things. And the, the senior management don't know how to assess who to believe or what to do. Mm. Um, and so they tend to start, um, because they're political appointees, 
primarily because of their loyalty to the president, appointed directly by the president. Um, they tend to manage the police um, as a public relations exercise. They don't know how to fix the problem. The things they try and do often don't yield the results they're told will, that they should be expecting. Um, and so then they start to going into kind of a state of denial, become very defensive, um, appoint more loyalists to them around them in senior echelons, which worsens the problem, so more functions start uh, not performing the way they should. And that is why the National Development Plan calls for the senior leadership to be assessed by a national policing board that's multi-sectoral, multidisciplinary, to make sure that every one of the current uh, serving senior national leaders and provincial leaders who've got lieutenant general ranks and major general ranks, have the right skills, experience, expertise and integrity to hold those posts and fulfill the requirements of those posts. We do have such people in the South African Police Service. People who joined the South African Police Service in 1994, 20 years ago, have 20 years of experience. Some, some of them have got tertiary education, master's degrees, some of them got PhDs. But they are stuck at lower levels in the organization because they're not politically connected, because they're professional police officials. So we've got to start seeing the South African Police Service not as a, a state security structure that is there to act in the interest of a well-connected political elite, as it's currently functioning, but as a public service that serves the interests of all South Africans and make sure that we draw from the best that we have amongst this large organization and that you can only be in charge if you really know what you're doing and you've got the background, the experience and the integrity, very important integrity, um, so that you can then start putting the police on a, plan, a, a clear plan of action to fix it. So they have enough resources, we have enough experience, we know we can get on top of these crime challenges. Um, the police have done good jobs in many cases before. Uh, what we need is the leadership team that has the authority and the knowledge and expertise to bring these functions together to, to, to fix the problems that are facing the police related to things like corruption, brutality on one hand, and improve the ability to use the current existing resources to target those that are committing these kinds of crimes. And you will see these crimes go down. Um, there's no doubt about it, we've seen this happen in the past. So I think we've got to start seeing the implementation of the National Development Plan recommendations. Adopted in 2012, to date there's no indication they're being implemented. But when they are implemented, we will start seeing changes within the next few years, very positive ones. That was Gareth Newham of the Institute for Security Studies speaking to Crema Media's policy about violent crime in South Africa.